She says that some 15 years ago, she lived in and around Shawneetown and was stolen and sold into slavery. Her name is Lucinda, and at the time she was taken, she had two children. She says she worked at the Salt Works. J.H.C. Ellis, 1843, Barron County, Kentucky. Many profited from slave labor, and one that comes to mind was John Hart Crenshaw. Crenshaw leased the state-owned salt works along the Saline River near Equality in southeastern Illinois. The salt works were one of the prime employers of slave labor in early Illinois. Crenshaw used resources from his investments in the salt industry, as well as other endeavors to construct a substantial home, Hickory Hill, just east of Equality. He is believed to also have been active in a reverse underground railroad in which he kidnapped African Americans and sold them into slavery. In 1842, Crenshaw was accused of kidnapping Maria Adams and her children and having them taken across the Ohio River into slavery. He was acquitted. Crenshaw was indicted multiple times for his role in the disappearances of free blacks. Period documents confirm his involvement, although he was never convicted. In time, Crenshaw became a very wealthy man. In some cases, members of the larger community came to the aid of African-American neighbors. Galena resident, husband, and father, Jeremiah Boyd was an unemployed laborer who in 1860 was enticed to leave Galena by the offer of work in Iowa. Boyd and his family soon realized that they were in the hands of kidnappers bound for the slave state of Missouri. Boyd was killed when he confronted his captors and his family was taken into Missouri. Boyd's wife, Mary, was able to alert authorities to the kidnapping and her captors were arrested. Residents of Galena traveled to Missouri and brought Mary and her children back home. It was the voice, oftentimes, of young people mm -hmm. who were willing to spread the message that injustice was not acceptable. And that rallied our country through another difficult period. And here we are commemorating 50 years of that movement this year. That's right. So what I'm hearing is that young people have a voice. You may not ha have right now the right to decide it, but you certainly have a voice. So the question is, how do we use that voice? How would you use that voice? I talked to Isaiah earlier today, and um, we had a conversation. One of the things, people, one of the groups that he, that he admires, or has, um, that we talked about, were, was the Black Panther Party. And we, um, and I was just sharing with him earlier that when I was a young man, or let's say younger than now, um, that I was very familiar with that organization and um, realized that even at some of its grassroots, there were some very positive things there, some things that happened for their communities and, and the reasons why they started. But it was all about having a voice. Many of, them, many of those who were part of that organization were young people, mm -hmm. young voices. Um, Maybe as an individual, you might feel as though you're not being heard. But maybe as a group, collectively, your voice gets a little bit louder. So in school, give me some examples of places where you have the ability to use your voice. When you're running for an office in your school. Okay, so student government. All right. Sports. Sports. How about you, Larry? In the lunchroom. In the lunchroom. You know, I'll tell you, um, you know, it's often said that, that um, most business decisions aren't, aren't decided in the, um, uh, in the boardroom, but probably in the lunchroom. <laughs> so having a voice in the lunchroom is really important. Setting the right tone, um, surrounding yourself with, with, with positive people, having positive conversations about, about 
life and goals and things. That's, that's, that's pretty significant, so that's good. You may remember, as I well do, that from Louisville to the mouth of the Ohio, there were on board ten or a dozen slaves shackled together with irons. That sight was a continual torment to me. Abraham Lincoln, 1855.